So, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here again in Singapore. Well, you have seen the title of my talk. So, let's try to figure out like this. So, this is the menu. First of all, I like to explain you, if you haven't heard about it, the definition of a mod general mod phi or a mod Gauss convergence and some new results. Then I like to explain which type of higher order approximation I like to consider with some known results and finally some models with, with some structure, so some dependent structure will appear and then I will present some new results. So this is joint work with a former PhD student, Lukas Knichel, and two PhD students from Bochum, Caroline Klemann and Marius Putzek. So what is mod phi convergence? So here's a very general, very most general definition I know. So you're considering a sequence of random variables, real valued. They converge, so this sequence converge mod phi. So what is phi? Phi is a fixed given infinite divisible distribution. So this is fixed, it could be the Gaussian, it could be another one. And we are considering its Laplace transform. And I denote the Laplace transform of the fixed infinite divisible distribution by e to the eta. And then normally this eta is called the Levy exponent. So the definition is saying that it converges mod phi with respect to this distribution on a certain domain on the complex plane with a sequence of parameters which are growing. This is the, the next input, and a certain limiting function called psi. And what we're doing, we're asking for a local uniform convergence on this domain. So considering the Laplace transform of the object of interest, and we divide it by not the Laplace transform of the given distribution phi, but uh, with uh, a rescaled Laplace transform. So mod phi converging is meaning point-wise locally uniform that we have a convergence of the term of the left-hand side to this maybe concrete function psi of z. So the idea is that this, this object is for sure not a random variable which converges as a sequence to a normal or to this given function phi. So we have some renormalization, and the idea is to, to find a renormalization such that higher order terms can be seen. So this is the very general definition due to Kowalski and Nicobaldi almost 10 years ago. A very nice uh, remark is a theorem which is saying if you have mod phi convergence with parameter tn and this function psi, then this object converges to a standard normal distribution. So you have a central limit theorem as a consequence of the mod phi convergence. And very often, looking back to the rich, rich literature in this topic, the way of proving a central limit theorem can be adapted to prove mod phi. So using normally complex analysis, Fourier transform, look in the proofs of proving a central limit theorem and whatever it means by adaption, but a certain adaption gives you even the more fine result, which is mod phi convergence. So I like to explain it to the most simple example, which is a partial sum of an IID sequence, which are centered random variables. Let's consider on the level of the characteristic function, the log characteristic function. So using the independence of the input, it's n times the series, which is given well known by the cumulants of the fixed distribution y. So this is the standard object, so the sum of the IID random variables. Now, 
we consider a certain rescaling n to the 1 divided by nu for a fixed nu, which will be explained in the next line. So when we change this scale, I wrote down this expansion of the log moment generating function once more, put out the second term, and here now you can see the role of this fixed constant nu. It's saying that after the second cumulant, the next cumulant should be the nth one. So maybe it's the third, maybe it's the fourth, or whatever. So this is my assumption. Let's consider a log characteristic function expansion such that after the second term, the next term is the term number nu. So now going back to the definition of uh, mod phi convergence, so this identity is meaning that our characteristic function of the object of interest, which is xn, divided by e to the this object, so this is the Laplace transform of the normal distribution, here's a z squared divided by 2, and a prefactor, which is our sequence tn, and we have the limit, which is nothing else but the first summand and the exponential function of this. We even have some, some order of how, how fast this is converging. So this statement is saying, going back to the definition, that this sequence is mod phi convergence, so especially mod Gaussian convergence, of the limiting function of this. And the scaling sequence Tn is n to this power given in nu. So this is the simplest example of, yes, this is the summarizing. I just said this. So let, let's put it more precise. Let's assume in addition that the distribution is symmetric, so the third cumulant does not appear. And let, let us assume that the, the next one appears, so this is the fourth cumulant. And then we try to Keep in mind that the Tn is, in this case, as you can see here, the square root of n. So there are a lot of examples now in the literature where we have mod Gauss or mod phi convergence. Here's a very nice one where you consider, in the theory of random matrices, an arbitrary unitary matrix, hard distributed, and you're considering something like the log characteristic function. Then this is an example which converges mod Gauss, and the parameter sequence Tn is log n, almost log n, and here's a very concrete limiting function which is given by the so-called Barnes G function, where I just wrote down the bar Barnes G function is defined to solve this identity where the gamma function is the classical gamma function. So this is an interesting old story in the sense that in a very nice paper by Keating and Snaes, this result appears, but not in the new language of mod phi or mod Gaussian convergence. This was carefully done in the other paper by Kowalski and Nicobaldi. Another example with the same result with respect to the sequence and to the, to the limiting function is consider a GUE random matrix, so a Gaussian unitary ensemble matrix, and there the log determinant satisfies the central limit theorem, but moreover it satisfies this mod Gaussian convergence with the same objects. So carefully this was worked out in this paper by Dal Borgo and co-authors, but indeed not knowing the notion of mod phi convergence in the joint paper with Hannah Döring, we did the same with a complete different technique, which is bounding cumulants. And the fourth example is uh, what we did uh, two years ago. So this is from the point of view of random matrix theory, very classical one. It's the Laguerre ensemble. So we consider n times p of n matrices chosen to be filled with Gaussian random variables and we consider 
this A, A dagger times A, this is called the Laguerre complex ensemble, and it's famous because the joint distribution of its eigenvalue is pretty well known. This is the famous Fundermond determinant, and then this is uh, the uh, Hamiltonian. And, well, this is a very concrete formula, and in random matrix theory, everything is almost easy nowadays when you know the joint distribution. Exactly, then you, for example, with uh, using Zilberg's integral identities, can use, uh, uh, you can calculate some, some moments. So here the notion is we take a random Laguerre matrix and uh, considering the determinant, and then this moment can be represented exactly using Zilberg's identities. So these identities are deep, but we do only have to apply these. So some products of quotients of, of, of gamma functions very often appear in this, in this field. So what is this identity sometimes called Malin transform saying? Well, when we take the log of the determinant of this random matrix and uh, take the exponential moment function, so the log moment generating function, then this is nothing else but we have to consider the logarithm of this term. Now with uh, complex analysis, so this is the first term and this is the logarithm of this product of quotient of gamma functions. I, I, I don't like to repeat it again. And then with the help of a lot of stuff from complex analysis, we were able to prove that there is again a more Gaussian convergence of the log determinant of this ensemble and of many other random matrix ensembles, and the TN is mostly behaving like log off. And we are, have some different cases where uh, we have symmetric uh, matrices where N is PN, so we are considering N times PN of N matrices, and we have some, some other behavior such that the PN could be different from N, and we have a concrete, almost concrete, Function. So the limiting function is the object of interest, which is called psi. And here's a description of the logarithm of this function. And this is coming out from all this uh, complex analysis. Almost concrete formula, this identity. The surprising fact is if you consider a fixed P, which might be not of that interest in considering matrices, then you obtain another than a Gaussian mod convergence. So the, here you have some implicit uh, known uh, infinite divisible distribution. We have again a mod phi convergence. Now the TN is changing from the log scale to, to behave like N and a very concrete psi function, much easier. So different things are happening. So the real advantage of this mod phi approach is that more or less nowadays looking in the literature, especially uh, around the, the group of Ashkan de Gebaldi, uh, you automatically become extended central limit theorems, precise deviation results and rate of convergence. So at the moment nothing has to do with Stein's method, but it will change in some slides. So for example, if you have on a certain domain on the complex plane, proven the mod Gaussian convergence, then you have an extended central limit theorem in saying, so this is the classical statement of having a central limit theorem, but here the x now can grow. It has to be a little o of log n. For all this x, you have a central limit theorem. So you have it extended to a certain range. So this is some type of very precise large deviation principle, so you, you, you get a classical Gaussian part, so for a fact, fixed n, but you, you have to describe it very carefully with your function, which is the function of the mod phi convergence, the psi function. And even rate of convergences can be considered, so in the example of the log determinant of Laguerre's ensemble, you, we have a rate which is 1 divided by square root of this Tn, which was in most of the cases log n. Okay, and the last example is uh, 
for some surprise, included in studying some random matrix theory, and this is more coming from stochastic geometry. So a nice model which was studied, for example, in the paper I put here on the slide from Julian Grote, Saka Kabluczko, and Christoph Thäle, uh, that you're considering a certain number of random points in Rn, so the number of points is Pn of P of n plus 1, and your, well, the distribution, as an example, is the multivariate distribu Gaussian distribution. So you're considering these points Gaussian distributed in the n-dimensional space. And the object of int interest is the logarithm of the Pn dimensional volume of the simplex with vertices, which are these random points. And, uh, well, the, 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 the nice idea of, of the paper I mentioned here and of what we did is that the dimension of the space, n, and the number of points which you're considering, which is pn plus 1, are allowed to grow simultaneously. So many results in thoracic geometry before have been proven in n, which is the dimension, but for a fixed number of points. So the result is... Uh, it behaves, it satisfies the log Gaussian convergence and the scale, uh, so the, the scaling sequence Tn is in most of the cases the log n and this function has the same description as in the <coughs> Laguerre ensemble case, it differs only by minus z squared divided by 2. So we did it in the way I mentioned with uh, the technique of uh, complex analysis, and this paper did it by bounding very carefully cumulants. So here is uh, the idea of uh, considering higher order approximation, which goes back to Jacin Bahumi Andreani, who's now working in our, at our at my place in Bochum as well, which is which is which is great. So he's starting with an arbitrary sequence Xn, converging mod Gauss, so only mod Gauss will be considered up to now. Um, well, and uh, it's, uh, it's a, bit a little less general because we are now considering mod Gauss convergence only on the imaginary part, so not, not, not on the whole complex plane, so we have to consider a domain in, in, the, in, the, in the complex line. So we have, uh, so let us start with this random variable and the observation, which is a nice theorem, is for a nice class of psi function, when con one is able to construct a family of random variables depending on psi and Tn, so both those objects of the mod Gaussian convergence come into play such that this is behaving just as the given sequence, so it has exactly the same mod Gaussian behavior. This looks very abstract, but it's very concrete because here is, the, here is the density of this distribution. So the density of this distribution is a Gaussian part, so here's the x squared divided by Tn, so it's a normal distribution with variance Tn. And you have to multiply, if you know concrete, your function by this psi function of the Mount Gaussian world at the point x divided by Tn. And then you have to normalize it to become a density. So this is a very nice observation. And the question is, so if we have a sequence, Xn, which has mod Gauss behavior, and we have a very concrete one, which is a penalized Gaussian distribution, can we bound the distance, for example, in the Kolmogorov distance of these two random objects? And remember, when we have Gauss, mod Gaussian behavior, then dividing by square root of Tn, this object has, satisfies the central limit theorem, so we even can try to analyze the bound we are asking for to see whether this is exact the same 
quality as a barrier seam bound for the convergence in law to the Gaussian distribution. So, and uh, Jacin did, did the following. I'd like to present his results first. So, he is considering the toy example, IID partial sum. So, now we take the 1 divided by n to the power 1 fourth, meaning with respect to my first slide, so this parameter nu is 4, so the third cumulant is 0 and the fourth is non-zero. And in this case, we have a tn as being n square root of n. And here is, sorry, here is the psi function. So, in this case, so we have a concrete, let's go back, we have a concrete psi function. And now we can immediately wrote down our new density, which is the penalized Gaussian, and this is looking in this special case like this. So here you can see the difference, which is uh, coming from our psi function. So this is the penalization. Okay, and uh, Jacin's idea was, well, let's consider this uh, using Stein's method. So we have to care on Stein's method for a density like this, and he did it in a very long way. And, uh, well, I, I told him maybe it's much easier to do it directly because this density is very nice. We have already the density approach due to Stein. And uh, even it's a log concave density, we have some new results from uh, these three authors uh, considering bounds on the solution and higher order derivatives to be able to, yeah, well, to start with uh, the Stein method in solving this identity. So you can see this, this part is the classical one, so the normal distribution approach where you only have to consider the square root of n. And then the next perturbation operator, so to say, is coming into play, and this is the new object you have to, to analyze. So the, for the first part, in practice, you only have to rewrite everything which is known in different types of models in, in, in considering this one divided by square root of n, and this is really the new part of Klein's time. So, but of course, you have to solve the equation, you have to bound solutions and its higher derivatives. So his first result is that if you have test functions, so let us go back, so you like to measure the distance of your random object with respect to the underlying law, which is now this law, and solving Stein's equation is uh, now you're free in choosing your class of test functions uh, for a certain distance uh, and, and, and then try to, to operate on, on, on the left-hand side. So his uh, this, uh, distance is uh, given by those test functions which are uniformly bounded, and the same is true for its first derivative. And the result is, here is the main part, it's of order 1 divided by n to 1 fourth. So this is not the object which satisfies the central limit theorem, this is the mod Gaussian object. Meaning, as a remark, when we consider the object which satisfies the central limit theorem, now we compare it with this distribution, not with a standard normal distribution, and we, he, Jacin, obtained the same bound one divided by square root of n, with a not very perfect constant, so this is not, not, not the object of interest here. Well, this is a long story, and uh, considering various scene, Quality, this is okay, it's, it's another proof. Maybe the proof is much too complicated. But here is uh, the next step. So if you take a distance where you assume in addition that the second derivative of your test function exists and is uniformly bounded, then with respect to this distance, you get a rate which is one divided by square root of n. And on the CLT level, this is meaning that you really improve the various scene. You get a 1 divided by n, which is pretty nice. But it's the 
distance with respect to this class of test functions. Well, this is a bit away, or some, some people would say far away from, from the Kolmogorov distance. So the only thing at the moment which is possible to, to, to improve this in, on the level of the Kolmogorov distance, you, you get, so I'm not able to get one divided by n, but so Jacin did this job. He's, he's able to get one divided by n to two thirds, which is an improvement of the classical result, anyhow. So this is only giving a formal description of what's, what's happening. So this is the classical partial sum of IID random variables, very simple example, anyhow. And we are comparing this with this function. But this is my notation of, this is the new density I showed you before. Well, and in comparison to the classical uh, distance with respect to the standard normal distribution, so the correction term is exactly the difference of the normal to this new distribution, which, for example, can be described like this, so this is only easy way, very implicit way of describing the cor additive cor uh, the improvement of the Barry as seen result in describing it as an additive correction. So the challenges in uh, Racine's approach is that, yes, he is really to get the improvement considering the second derivative of the test function, meaning in Stein's world that you have to care on the third derivative of the solution because you need it to get this improvement. So this is hard work. So you have to bound the third derivative. That might be possible in future time not to, to bound this for, for other examples. And the new perturbative operator is the new object which has to be analyzed. And he did it for the IID partial sum with the zero bias technique, by the way. So our goal in uh, my group is now to go on. So let's first see whether it really it's necessary that the, the uh, random variables i are identically distributed. So the first, first case we analyzed is the independent but not identically distributed case. And then we started to, quite generally, try to, to get an idea what's going on with all the models which are described by exchangeable pairs. But, but mostly we have in mind the Curie-Weiss model as a very nice toy model for exchangeable pair approach. And finally, the dependency graph structure, so when the dependency can be described by the dependency graph. So we try to, to get the first result. And future question is whether if the function psi is getting more complicated, we have any chance to go through Stein's method, which is very easily much more complicated and maybe not, <laughs> not the right way to do but this is. So here is uh, some, some more technical details. So let, let make the story short. We have an independent situation, centered random variables. They are independent, but they are not longer identically distributed. And what we use is, for example, the exchangeable pair approach. So exchangeable pair is meaning there exists a sequence of random variables x n prime, such that the conditional expectation is looking like this, it's one minus a small number, one divided by n times xn. So this can be constructed. It's the easiest case where you can do so. And we're considering this object again, and have at the first step to compare, as in, 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 in improving a standard central limit theorem, this, this operator. So again, the new thing is here, the square root of n, and, and when we do it as it was done in the literature and looks nice. It look, looks nice because here we have a sum of n objects and we have a prefactor which is of this size, so it looks like one divided by square root of n. So this is our, our goal. We like to have a bound which is of order one divided by square root of n. And next we have to consider this perturb perturbative operator. So the third power of the random variable times our solution of Stein's equation time of, of xn. So this is 
much more complicated, but there are some, some tricks in the literature. So the first trick is that take the x squared time f as being a new function f tilde. So then this can be represented as xn times another function, which is f tilde of xn. So the idea is, well, for this object, a lot of representations exist. So here's a very classical one with respect to the literature on exchange repairs due to Kim An Chao and uh, Louis Chen. So uh, we have a nice integral representation with respect to the derivative of this new function f tilde, and you have to multiply with this sort of kernel function k hat. So the second equality is known from the literature. And this is enough, so now we have to care on, sorry, um, on the derivative of this function. Let's look again. So this is x squared times the solution of Stein equation. And we have to take on the derivative of this function. It is looking like this. So some more terms, which are problematic because we even have the xn squared in front are coming into play. But the, the, finally, it, it, it works very nicely and uh, gives Again, a one divided by square root order for this situation. Very nice toy model is the Curie-Weiss model. So you, here you have a dependent structure given uh, with this density. So the underlying law is a very easy one. It's the n-fold product of flipping a coin with values minus plus, plus one, so this is in physics called a spin. But now you have a Gibbsian measure, which is a mean field type, so you're multiplying uh, for each pair of spins uh, the product of spins. And, uh, well, as a mean, to, to become a mean field model, you have to divide by n, and you plug in a, a, a very important constant, which is uh, the so-called inverse temperature. So now it's a Gibbs measure model where the particles try to align themselves together with the same spin. So this is, this, this is the idea of the model. The model has the idea to, to show some spontaneous magnetization and so on. So a nice toy model for probabilists. Uh, Richard Ellis and Chuck Newman a long time ago proved that for high temperature, the magnetization, so the sum of the spins divided by square root of n behaves like in the independent case. So we have a normal distribution, and the variance is looking like this, meaning that we have some problems at the critical temperature, beta equal 1. There the behavior is different, but that's not the topic of today. There's some phase transition. So for this object, so the sum of the spin divided by square root of n in the Curie-Weiss model with a classical flipping spins with probability one half plus or minus one, we can construct, sorry, we can construct an exchangeable pair. So we, we take this sum, we throw out the i's summon, so the capital I is a random point in the interval uh, one up to n, and we put in a, a new random variable which has a certain distribution. It's a conditional distribution of a spin given all the others. And then the identity, which is called the exchangeable pair identity, uh, is given like this Wn prime has a conditional expectation with respect to Wn. Let's consider here 1 minus now the 1 divided by n before in the independent case is now 1 minus beta divided by n, and there's some remainder term. This is, can be handled. So since a long time, since Andrew Barber's paper in 80, for this model, the best Kolmogorov bound, 1 divided by square root of n, was considered, and then two other papers by Shataji and Kim An Shao, they considered much more distributions which appear in the critical case, and in a paper together with Matthias Löwe, I considered a, a bigger class of Curie-Weiss models, so this is, this is the history of considering Stein's method to be able to get various seen results for this 
mean spin variable. Well, and for some reasons, uh, so we do not care at the first step whether this model satisfies the mod Gaussian definition. I try to, it's, 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 it's not that easy, but I feel because it's in the high temperature normally behaving like an independent situation, let's, let, let's do just the same. So let's start with this psi function, again with the Tn chosen to be square root of n, and this is now uh, our random variable, so the sum of the spin divided by n to the power of one fourth, and the result is actually that with respect to the distance where we assume the second derivative of the test function to be uniformly bounded, we obtain a one divided by square root of n rate, meaning that we improve the rate with respect to this distance to one over n, or the Kolmogorov distance, at least to this, to this order. So this is nice, and saying, well, this machinery introduced by Jacine seemed to work in different cases. So, sketch of the proof. So, we're very lucky to see the new paper by Kim Wan Chao and Zhang from last year, where they, in a very general situation, considering unbounded exchangeable pair approach, uh, introduced to, to, to bound this conditional expectation. Why ever? So experts immediately see this is interesting. Normally it's Wn minus Wn prime to the power two, and now it's different because it's considering this, this object. And this is very helpful, so because it's, it's, it's very similar to, to, to consider the covariance, the correlation, sorry, the co correlation between two spins of this model. So I'm, 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 I'm thinking in the Curie-Weiss model, not in the general exchangeable pair approach. So, and you have, we have for some technical reasons to, to be able to analyze this, this perturbative object uh, to, to take the spin number one, so the i spin to the square times another spin, the j spin to the square, and, and we have to measure how this is correlated. And to do this, it's very helpful to see this, this, this inequality I, I'm showing here. And then on the level of the central limit theorem, we obtain the one divided by square root of n. And again, the, the object, which is a bit harder, is to, to analyze this operator. It can be rewritten, as I described you before, with this f tilde function. And then you start to get classical identities on the level of exchangeable pair approach and finally get in terms which are of order one divided by square root of n. And uh, finally, so the, the famous class of dependency graphs could be started to, to analyze, and, 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 and we have some, some partial results on, on this. So here is the definition, the graph, capital L, with a vertex set A is a dependency graph of a collection of random variables where the index set is A. If uh, it's true that for this disconnected subsets of the, of the vertex set, uh, the subfamilies are independent. Roughly, in other words, there is only an edge between pairs of dependent random variables. So the easiest model is the famous Erdős-Rényi graph model GNP, and you're counting subgraphs. For example, it's counting triangles. Then this, there is counting triangles is meaning is that you have to care on those triangles which which share an edge. So that this is the only dependence in this model. So you take an, an edge between two triangles an edge in your dependency graph if these two triangles share an edge, which is a different edge. Okay, this is a classical example. So in the dependency graph model, the setting is normally as, uh, as follows, and in this setting pretty much is known. So you take a certain number n n of bounded random variables. They assume to be uniformly bounded. You have a family such that there is a dependency graph, 
an important object in the dependency graph is the maximal degree of this graph, which is called for some technical reasons dn minus 1. And we're considering the partial sum of these dependency graph random variables. And the sigma n squared is denoted to be the variance of this object. And since a long time, people care on this type of model. And for example, Svante Janssen proved a very nice bound on the R's cumulant of SN, so, yeah. and which, is, which, which, which is quite sharp, independent of the quality of this constant. But the constant is, is, is not important in, in our context. So what, what's happening here with this cumulant bound, you, here is the number of summons. Here is this maximal degree of the graph. This is appearing in, to a power r minus 1. So for the variance, it's, it's, it's the number of variables times dn. And here is this uniform constant, which is important. So otherwise, it's far away from easy to, to, to bound cumulants. So, Yes, as I just tried to explain, the second cumulant is bounded by nn times dn. So an additional assumption is that this quotient is really converging to a fixed constant. And this is the main assumption normally in, 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 in this setting. And then the standardized Sn satisfies the central limit theorem. And for example, using Stein's method, you can obtain the rate of convergence, which is of this order. So the dn can grow, so the maximal degree of your underlying graph can grow, but not faster than the number of summons, and, and, and this is the rate function, at the, the rate of convergence, sorry. So, and in this uh, area, which is uh, very, very general, and, and that's, uh, that's the point why it's getting, at least from a technical point of view, quite hard. We do the, the following together with Caroline Kleemann. So this is the classical assumption to, to be sure that we have a central limit theorem. And now we consider that the third cumulants or the third moments are zero. So we have some symmetric situation. And uh, we are assuming not only the existence of the fourth moments or cumulants, but that they behave like the bound on the cumulant is explaining. So the, the fourth cumulant can be bounded by n, n times the maximal degree to the power 3. So this is the reason why we are considering this object. So these are our two assumptions. So three assumptions, because the third moment should, should, should be 0. And then this is the right object, which satisfies the more Gaussian convergence. And the Tn is this. And the limiting function is the classical one I showed you at the very beginning for IID partial sums. And now with respect to the distance which is given by test functions where we assume that the first derivative is uniformly bounded, we have a rate of convergence which is the right one because this gives back the very seen rate I showed you before. So the, the CLT rate of convergence, which, which is known, but the next step has to be done. So this is our hope. And it seems at the moment that we are doing things too general. So we should concentrate on some examples of dependency graph structure, some concrete examples, because, oh, well, I don't know why. But at the moment, I cannot say that we are improving the various rate for these models. Maybe for good reasons, I don't know. Thank you very much.